Hi, and welcome to our video on the regulation of development in multicellular organisms. Whether we're a human, a fruit fly, or a plant, we need to develop from a single cell into a multicellular organism. And that process needs to be tightly controlled and tightly regulated, at least if we want it to all work out okay. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this video. The question that we're going to be answering is how is development controlled? Because when it's not controlled, things go really funky really quickly. This may look like a normal fruit fly to you, but you may not have noticed that rather than having antenna on its head, it has feet. Something has happened in the development of this fruit fly that has led to feet being on its head. And I don't know about you, but I think that's probably a situation that's best avoided. In this video, we're going to look at the regulation of development in multicellular organisms in very broad terms. And specifically, we're going to look at the processes that lead to cellular differentiation, or how we get different types of cells produced in an organism where every cell has the same genome. I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that development is regulated through the actions of proteins. There are particular families of proteins that are responsible for the development of multicellular organisms. Probably the most famous of these are the homeobox, or Hox genes, that regulate the development of different body segments. What we see here is a diagram of a fruit fly and the different Hox genes that are expressed in each segment during the development of the fly. We can compare those Hox genes to the Hox genes that we find in vertebrates like mice and in mammals, and we find that these genes are evolutionarily very ancient. What we mean by that is that these genes arise very early in the history of multicellular organisms like animals, and are then highly conserved throughout all of the lineages that evolve from those evolutionarily ancient organisms. And the evidence for this comes from a variety of experiments that were done looking at the relationships among these different genes. Let's look at one particular example involving the homeobox genes that are responsible for the development of eyes in different animals. What we see up at the top are wild type images of the eyes in these four different animals. And notice that we've got three different vertebrates and an invertebrate arthropod, the fruit fly, Drosophila. Below those, we see the results of mutations that have occurred in the same Hox gene and how those mutations affect the development of the eyes in these organisms. And what we can see is that these mutations have similar effects on these different lineages of organisms, suggesting that these genes evolved before these organisms diverged from each other. To really drive that point home, let's look at this particular Drosophila mutant. When the Hox gene involved in the development of the eye in a mouse was transplanted into the genome of the Drosophila and duplicated at many different locations. Not only did the Drosophila mutant develop multiple non-functional eyes all over its body, but it developed Drosophila eyes, suggesting that the sequence of the mouse Hox gene for eye development is so similar to the sequence of the same Hox gene in Drosophila that the Drosophila system could interpret that as if it were its own Drosophila Hox gene. This is what we mean when we say that these genes are evolutionarily ancient. They've been around for a very long time, much longer than the current diversity of animals on the planet that we see. All of this discussion of the Hox genes gets at a much more broad fact, which is that developmental controls like Hox genes are transcription factors. They are part of the group of proteins that associate at the promoters of eukaryotic genes and control whether or not those genes are transcribed or not. Hox genes themselves get that name because they all have a recurrent motif known as a homeodomain, which is a region of a protein that associates directly with DNA. They are transcription factors and they are structured as such. In order to understand how transcription factors work and how they can lead to the differentiation and development of an organism, we need to understand that they function like switches. Let's look at three different types of cells that we would find in a particular model eukaryote. We have a gene that's going to make a particular protein product, which is preceded by a promoter for RNA polymerase. Along with that promoter, we have different regions of the genome that will associate with different types of transcription factors. In cell type one, this particular transcription factor will associate with this gene, and as a result, RNA polymerase will transcribe the gene and make the protein product. In cell type two, 
we will get a different transcription factor, but that can also associate with a different region of the gene and allow for RNA polymerase to transcribe this gene and make the same protein product. In cell type 3, we have a different transcription factor, but there is no region of this gene for it to associate with. As a result, RNA polymerase will not attach to the promoter, and we will not get transcription of this gene product in this cell type. Looking at even this simplified example, we can see how we're already leading to differential gene expression in these three different types of cells. In two of the cells, we've made a particular protein product, and in the third, we haven't, due to the presence or absence of particular transcription factors that associate with the promoter of that particular gene. This is what we refer to as cellular determination. It's the changes in gene expression that occur as a result of the differences in the transcription factors that are present. And it's cellular determination that leads to differentiation or the development of different types of cells in a multicellular organism. The cells in one region or organ or tissue of our body are different from the cells in other regions and organs and tissues because of these different patterns of gene expression mediated through the action of transcription factors. And these patterns were established very early on in our development, almost immediately after fertilization occurs. Another important thing that cells need to be able to do in a developing multicellular organism is get positional information about where they are in the organism. This is also accomplished through differences in the concentrations of proteins found in different regions of the organism. This positional information is chemically determined through different concentrations of different proteins that are present in different regions of the organism. In order to get our heads around this, let's pretend that this circle represents a developing organism. Let's put some coordinates on there so we can understand what we're looking at. Let's look at the concentrations of just two different chemicals. Our first concentration is going to be this blue protein, and we can see that we have a difference in where it is found depending upon where we are on the x-axis of our grid coordinates. Now let's look at a second protein that exists on a gradient in the y-axis of our coordinates, and we can see that just through the differences in concentrations of these two different proteins, we're already getting positional information about which quadrant of the organism we're in. Now consider the fact that there are many, many different proteins that exist on these gradients, and you can start to understand how very complex patterns of positional information are conveyed to different regions of the cells in a developing organism. Here's a picture of three different molecules that are present in a developing Drosophila embryo at roughly the same period of time. And you can see that each of these molecules, which have kind of cool names, you can see them up at the top, are each present in different regions of that embryo at this moment in time. As a result, different positional information is being sent to the sections of the embryo where these different molecules are found. And given that these molecules are also serving as transcription factors in those cells, the different patterns of determination and differentiation in these regions will occur as a result. Another way of putting this is that gene expression is both spatially and temporally specific. For the particular pattern of gene expression in any cell in a developing organism, it is not only dependent upon where it is in the organism, but it's also dependent upon the particular time in the developmental program that we're looking at in any particular region. As the organism continues to develop, local signals between neighboring cells will start to play big effects as well. This diagram is showing the interchange between two different molecules called delta and notch in two different neighboring cells in a developing organism. The cell on the left has high concentrations of the delta molecule, which is leading it down a differentiation pathway into a neuron or a nerve system cell. The expression of delta on its surface is interacting with the notch protein and the cell on the right, which is causing that cell to decrease the amount of delta that it's expressing, causing it not to differentiate into a neuron. This is what's referred to as cellular induction, and it's important as the organism continues to develop because positional information early on in the embryo is, is relatively easy to convey in those initial concentration gradients that are established. But as the embryo continues to develop and differentiate, the expression patterns of neighboring cells need to play a larger and larger role in determining the differentiation pathways as the number of cells and the diversity of cell types in the organism increases. These were very broad strokes of developmental biology, but the important take-home point here is that all development is resulting from changes 
in gene expression. Changes in gene expression that are determined spatially and temporally in the developing organism that we lead to the determination of genetic fates of cells and the differentiation of all of the different types of cells that we find in a multicellular organism. Thanks so much for watching this video on the regulation of development. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the role of Hox genes in animal development. Make sure that you can explain how cellular differentiation results from changes in gene expression. Make sure that you can demonstrate how cells get positional information in a developing organism. And finally, make sure that you can explain the role of induction in differentiation. If you can do those things, you've got everything you need from this video. If not, that's okay too. This is pretty complicated stuff. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have here at the end so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.